It's a brand new era for James Bond, and I hope you brought a spare set of pants with you today because this film is going to scare the living daylight out of you. Let's get started. Welcome back to the Countdown to Bond 25 here on Thumb Together. I'm Andrew Fantasia, and today's film is The Living Daylights, which was released in late June 1987, just a scant few weeks after this handsome gent came into this world. This is another one of those Bond films where I'm really going to have to struggle and sweat here to explain the plot to you. Here is what I think is going on. There's this Soviet general named Koskov, and he is embezzling funds from the Russian government and using that money to buy opium from a group of Mujahideen rebels in Afghanistan and then selling the opium at an insane profit and then using that profit to buy arms from an American general named Brad Whitaker. I, I don't understand whatsoever. The title song of The Living Daylights was sung by another great 80s band, AHA. Now, AHA is nowhere near as prolific as Duran Duran, but I think it's kind of neat that we have two films in a row where you're just like, get this great 80s band, and now get that great 80s band. It really starts to feel like Bond has become even more popular, like this unstoppable train chugging along, and all the popular musicians want to jump on that bandwagon and play a song that'll go down in history, even though I don't really remember any of the lyrics to the Living Daylight song. But at least it's a movie of many firsts. The Living Daylights is our first time with the new Bond, Timothy Dalton. A Welshman with piercingly handsome eyes and a background in stage, Timothy Dalton was cast because he happened to look the most like the caricature that Ian Fleming had in mind when he wrote the Bond books back in the 50s. Now, a lot of people like to give Timothy Dalton flack. A lot of people will tell you that hands down, he is their least favorite Bond. To those people, I say, I respectfully disagree. I think Timothy Dalton is terrific. He makes a terrific James Bond. He came into the role approaching it from the Bond that he knew in the books because he had read the books and he wanted to play it a whole lot straighter. Roger Moore was playing it for chuckles, for laughs. Moore was winking at the camera every chance he gets. Timothy Dalton did not want to do that. He wanted to play a darker and much more serious James Bond. Not humorless, as a lot of critics will like to say about Dalton's two films, but more serious. And besides, you want to talk about firsts, you know what else happens in this movie for the first time? We see James Bond just on some carnival rides having fun. Again, not a humorless Bond. Look at him. He's having a great time. He's having so much fun on those rides. This is, what a beautiful evening he's having. There is nothing wrong with this James Bond. We also get to see for the first time ever a training exercise involving what I assume is the other 00 agents. Now, I always talk about how we never get to see the other 00 agents' faces or see them in the field. From the looks of things, we're finally starting to get that, even though it's not very satisfying. They are just generic dudes in black plain clothes climbing this mountain and then they get killed. See, I think it's weird that every time we see another 00 agent, they're either already dead or getting killed or whatever. When you think about James Bond and how much he survives, I imagine the other agents are much in the same vein. Let's see them doing something cool. I don't know. I just, I have not gotten the 00 action that I think these other characters deserve. But we're getting closer. James has two very cool gadgets in The Living Daylights that pull his ass out of the fire multiple times. The first is a key fob that emits a knockout gas if you whistle the first few bars of O Britannia, or if you whistle a wolf whistle, which I'm not really sure what a wolf was. They set it up where it's O Britannia, but then it just feels like as long as you whistle anything at all, the key fob will go off. So I'm not quite sure how that works. But more importantly, we have a brand new car, the Aston Martin V8 Vantage, which is still beautiful, even though it happens to be an 80s car. 80s cars were not known for their good looks, even though I have a soft spot for them. The V8 Vantage is tricked out with lasers and rockets and, and all kinds of fun things. It doesn't match the DB5, not by a long shot, but the V8 Vantage is a cool, classy 80s automobile, and I'm happy to add it to the pantheon of Bond vehicles. The leading lady of the living daylights is Kara Milovi, played by Miriam Dabo. And this is an example of an average woman done right. At least I think so. 
When you look back at A View to a Kill and you look at Stacey Sutton, who was just always confused and frightened and screaming and whatever, now you have this other woman who is also just a normal civilian. You know, she's a regular person. She's not a kick-ass spy. She's just trying to live her life. But they somehow managed to make her much more interesting than Stacey Sutton by giving her just stuff, by filling out her personality. She plays the cello. She is really good at playing the cello. She wants to play Carnegie Hall one day. She's full of all these little bits and pieces that make up a fully functioning human being. When I look at Stacey Sutton, I see the directors wanted James Bond to have arm candy. When I look at Kara Malovi, I see a normal person. I like Kara. She's great. And she plays a damn fine cello. Unfortunately, I can't muster the same enthusiasm for the villains of the picture. Our two main villains are General Koskov, the aforementioned Soviet general who embezzles all that money, uh, and he's just this slimy, slippery dude who's always lying. He's like, oh, I'm totally not a bad guy, and then he runs away, and he's like, guys, I got away from the good guys. I don't like Koskov all that much. I mean, he's entertaining, but he's not a great villain. And then the main villain, the final boss of The Living Daylights, if you will, is Brad Whitaker, played by Joe Don Baker, who is, I'm just going to say it, flat out pathetic. This is, without a doubt, my least favorite James Bond villain of all time. He's just a general who lives in this mansion and has wax statues of people like Genghis Khan and Adolf Hitler. And he's got a bunch of, you know, Warhammer tables where he's reenacting things like Custer's Last Stand and the Battle of Waterloo and playing with his little miniatures. And then he's got a gun with, like, body armor on it. And it's like, this dude sucks. He just flat out sucks. So thank God for his henchman, Necros. Necros is an assassin of the highest order. This guy gives off Red Grant vibes. He is so professional and so lethal. He reminds me of Agent 47 from the Hitman games because that's how he operates. He's always garroting people, uh, you know, sneaking up on them and choking them, taking their clothes and disguising himself as like the milkman or a DJ or whatever. He blends into the crowd. He hides as a balloon salesman. He is just the best assassin you could possibly ask for. And he almost gets the better of James Bond himself. I am giving the best quote of the film to James Bond. And again, it's a testament to how good Timothy Dalton is because when was the last time that we had the best quote attributed to Bond? It's been a minute. While trying to escape from Necros and the other assassins, James Bond and Kara Malovi are getting into a car chase, but then their car gets wrecked and all they have left is this giant cello case that Kara is carrying around. And there is a big snowy mountain between them and freedom. So what do they do? They hop onto the cello case and toboggan down the mountain on this cello case and they get right up to the Czechoslovakian border and as they plow through the border with assassins shooting at them and stunned border guards just watching with their jaws touching the floor, Bond yells out, we've nothing to declare. Remind me again why you think this James Bond is humorless. Just refresh my memory. Now, there is a problematic moment in The Living Daylights, and it does involve Bond doing something a little dark that I don't think Roger Moore would have done, so I will give negative points here for that. But there's a point where a gunman walks into a room, and in order to distract the gunman, James Bond kind of just puts a naked lady in front of him. He rips the lady's top and then pushes her into the way of the gunman, and the gunman is like, a what? and James uses that to get the upper hand. It's a dark move, and Bond is in a dark mood during that particular scene, but still, it doesn't play well today. Another thing that makes me happy here is that we finally get the return of James Bond's best buddy in the CIA, Felix Leiter. This time, Felix is played by John Terry. You might remember him as Christian Shepard on Lost, but uh, Felix is only in there for a hot minute. You barely get any Felix action, don't worry. There's way more Felix action to come tomorrow. But you do get a great assortment of traveling. James Bond goes to Tangier, Morocco. He goes to Czechoslovakia and Vienna and Afghanistan. He's all over the place. Unfortunately, that last bit happens at the climax there. And what we end up with is one of the blandest climaxes of any James Bond film. The whole thing takes place on a runway somewhere in the Afghan hinterlands. And they're surrounded by mountains and there's just these crates of opium and this plane and that's it. The mountains are brown and the plane is brown and the crates of opium are brown and everything is dusty. It is just aesthetically wretched. It is the most boring, 
unappealing looking set piece that I think any James Bond film has ever done. Now, aside from the weird Brad Whitaker toy shop wax museum of doom thing, you could tell that they were really trying to make The Living Daylights a much grittier Bond movie, especially coming hot off the heels of A View to a Kill. So I get it. They wanted this to be gritty. They wanted this to look minimalist because they were going for a new Bond approach. And you see that happen again when Daniel Craig steps into the scene. But there's gritty and then there's just ugly. Casino Royale is gritty. It still looks beautiful. Living Daylights, not so much. Thankfully, tomorrow's movie rectifies this problem and then some. So I'll see you here in 24 hours where we will be reinstating our license to kill and we'll be doing it in style, baby. The countdown to Bond 25 continues.